On January 6th, 2021, the mobs of Trump supporters swarming the Capitol building, breaking through police barriers, smashing windows, and eventually breaching the Senate chamber weren't just chanting Trump's name. And they weren't there because they just agreed with Trump's politics and thought he would be a better president than Biden. The crowds that day were there on a mission. To them, the mission was to save the United States of America, not from four years of a Democratic president, but from a biblical fall from grace. For many in the crowd that day, their presence at the insurrection was the fulfillment of their divine right, a fight against further persecution of their people, and a holy war ordained by God himself. They waved flags and signs that said, Jesus saves. They erected a giant cross next to gallows. When they broke into the Senate chambers, they bowed their heads in prayer. To ignore the role religion and specifically white Christian nationalism played in the January 6th insurrection would be to ignore a burgeoning threat to U.S. democracy that wasn't an isolated incident on that day. It's a threat that's been brewing for centuries, made more powerful by a perfect storm of far-right fear-mongering, internet communities, an influx of immigrants, BLM demonstrations, and a country that is no longer as Christian or as white as it once was, posing a perceived existential threat for those who believe in the United States as a white Christian nation ordained by God. Where did this idea come from and how did we get here? How is this fringe idea suddenly mainstream? What role does religion play in a country where there's supposed to be a wall between church and state? And is democracy really at stake here? When I set out to find answers to these questions, what I found was complicated, with deep roots in our history as a nation, and only made worse by the current problems this country is facing. This is how the religious right ruined everything. Roll the intro. <laughs> I'm super excited about my partner for today's video, Trade Coffee. I love coffee. Trade helps you discover great coffee from the best local roasters around. They have over 450 different coffees from dark roasts to blends to rare roasts to decaf and everything in between. So you'll be sure to find something you absolutely love. Trade recently sent me Perk Coffee's Decaf Columbia Roast. I'm a decaf girly lately, but I still love the taste and we deserve amazing coffee too, okay? Perk even sent me a sweet little handwritten thank you note with my order. I loved this coffee. Coffee. It was really smooth and flavorful. Trade's matching algorithm will curate your perfect next cup as well. And they have flexible subscription plans so you can pick what fits your lifestyle and tastes all in one. And this stuff is roasted fresh to order, either pre-ground or whole bean, so you know you're getting the freshest possible coffee. Plus, it comes shipped right to your door. And you know that I love a convenient moment. So what are you even waiting for? Click my link below or go to drinktrade.com slash and get a free bag of coffee with any subscription. Thanks, Trade. Before we dive in, let's get some definitions out of the way because these groups of people that I'm talking about fall into categories that are hard to define. The religious right is a political movement in the United States that's made up of activists, scholars, lawyers, and politicians that advocate and push for social and political conservatism. Generally, people who are part of the religious right are Christians, but they come from a wide variety of denominations. Evangelicals are a multi-denominational group of Christians made up of Reformed, Holiness, Anabaptist, Pentecost, Pentecostal, charismatic, and other Protestant traditions. According to the National Association of Evangelicals, their central beliefs include the belief that lives need to be transformed through a born-again experience and a lifelong process of following Jesus, the expression and demonstration of the gospel in missionary and social reform efforts, a high regard for and obedience to the Bible as the ultimate authority, and a stress on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as making possible the redemption of humanity. As many as 30 to 35 percent of Americans identify identify as evangelical, either culturally or actively practicing. Fundamentalist Christians are a group of people within the evangelicals that adheres to a literal interpretation of the Bible and enacts a strict code of conduct for its church members. White Christian nationalists are a group of people who believe that the United States was founded as a Christian nation and has been ordained by God to be a central force on earth. And like the Israelites, they came to America and took land that was rightfully theirs from the natives. That white people got here first and therefore deserve rights that other people especially non-white immigrants, don't. And that it is their divine right and duty to fight, as Jesus did in the book of Revelation, ultimately battling in a bloody, holy war against the treacherous forces of the Antichrist to take back the United States. Many white Christian nationalists are evangelicals, but not all evangelicals are white Christian nationalists. And not all white Christian nationalists are evangelicals. White Christian nationalism has been around for centuries. It allowed the Puritans to sleep at night as they stole land from natives. It allowed 
slaveholders to sleep at night, believing that owning humans was their divine right, and so on. But it's impossible to unpack the role that white Christian nationalism has played in this country without first unpacking the role that religion has played in this country, especially the role of religion in politics and government. Because this thing goes from the shanties in Appalachia all the way to the tippity top, my friends. Let's just start with the 20th century, because going all the way back would require a feature-length film. But if you want that information, you can find it in my research notes linked in my Patreon. As immigrants flocked to the U.S. during the turn of the 20th century, urban slums proliferated, promoting the use of sweatshops and creating poverty, disease, and overcrowding for immigrants. A group of Christians known as the Social Gospel Movement determined that the best way to change this would be to put their religious beliefs into practice and take it upon themselves to right society's wrongs. Around the same time, the Temperance Movement was championed in the late 1800s by evangelical Protestant reformers, especially women. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed in 1874, galvanizing women around alcoholism as a family issue and uniting women across class and race. Their dreams came to fruition 50 years later through the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1920, which prohibited the sale, manufacture, and transport of alcohol. Except, importantly, for churches, of course. The 1920s also saw the popularization of the radio, and you know evangelists were quick to adopt that technology. Sister Amy McPherson was the first conservative Christian celebrity. Using the newly popularized radio, Sister Amy basically invented the concept of televangelism and ushered in the age of the megachurch. Other popular Christian radio personalities at the time included Billy Sunday and Catholic priest Father Charles Coughlin, who used his weekly radio program to criticize the president and promote anti-Semitism. Back then, the church saw him as an embarrassment and eventually silenced him. Today, he would probably get a primetime show on Fox. Then, in 1925, a Tennessee biology teacher named John Scopes was found guilty of violating a state law that banned the teaching of Darwinian evolution in the classroom. That verdict was upheld by the Supreme Court. Despite the fact that this was technically a win for evangelicals, members of the national press made a mockery of fundamentalists for their conservative interpretation of the Bible, causing many conservative Protestants to retreat from the public sphere and remove themselves from national politics altogether, taking an isolationist stance for the next several decades and quietly organizing behind the scenes. In the 1930s and 40s, evangelical leaders began forging close ties with economically conservative businessmen with shared objections to political and theological liberalism and mainstream Christian leaders in the National Council of Churches. So they built a network of colleges, parachurch org, radio and television stations, and political action networks that combined Christian values, Jeffersonian democracy, aka belief in a limited federal government, and free market economics, creating a tie between evangelicals and wealthy corporations that exists to this day. After World War II, Americans flocked to church in record numbers. Church building increased and Bible sales were through the roof. And through propaganda in advertising, film, and public addresses, the government, working in tandem with religious leaders, connected communism with godlessness and atheism, differentiating it from the piety of democracy-loving Americans. This ushered in an era of using communism as a scapegoat for the threats of atheism and amorality. Anything that didn't fit the status quo was dangerous, suspect, and probably communist. See my video on communism for a deeper dive. In 1947, the Supreme Court solidified into law the idea of the separation between church and state. The separation of church and state, contrary to popular belief appears nowhere in the Constitution. The First Amendment guarantees the free exercise of religion, but it does not explicitly say there must be a separation of church and state. This idea comes from Thomas Jefferson, who interpreted the free exercise clause to guarantee a wall of separation between church and state. The fact that Jefferson, one of the framers of the Constitution, wrote these words is strong evidence that the intent of the Constitution was to create separation between church and state, but it's not explicitly written into the Constitution and is therefore a a bit more tenuous than I think the average American thinks. In 1947, in Everson v. Board of Education, Justice Hugo Black wrote, The establishment of religion clause in the First Amendment means at least this. Neither a state nor the federal government may set up a church. Neither can pass laws that aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. Neither can force a person to go or to remain away from church against his will or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. In the words of Jefferson, the clause against establishment of religion by law was in tended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. By the 1950s, fissures started showing between evangelicals and fundamentalists within the conservative Christian movement. Fundamentalists maintained that separation from mainstream popular culture and a position against secular society was best, while evangelicals argued that Christians had to engage and participate in the outside culture in order to set the world right and save the non-believers. 
So they embraced mainstream media, radio, and engaging with the larger culture, which was further strengthened in the 1950s when radio evangelists made the switch to television with the weekly television show Cathedral of Tomorrow, hosted by Rex Humbard, ushering in a new era of evangelism. Mainstream churches began to see a decline in enrollment in the 1960s, while evangelical churches thrived from the 50s into the 21st century. This is in part due to backlash from the civil rights movement, a movement in which many churches and church leaders were involved in the push for equality, creating a divide between mainstream denominations and the conservative Protestant evangelicals who were threatened by the civil rights movement. Evangelical dismay of change and this perceived disorder was exemplified by evangelical preacher Billy Graham's cozy relationship with Nixon, spurred by Nixon's promises to bring law and order to an increasingly chaotic and sinful world. A series of blows from the Supreme Court during the 60s and 70s also helped to galvanize evangelicals into political action. In the early 60s, New York state law recommended an official, non-denominational prayer for school children to recite. Five families sued a school district in a Long Island suburb, and when it made its way to the Supreme Court in 1962, in a case called Engel v. Vitale, the court ruled that the prayer violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which Justice Hugo Black, once again writing for the majority, saying, it is no part of the business of government to compose official prayers for any group of the American people to recite as a part of a religious program carried on by government. According to legal scholars, this school prayer decision was, in its day, the most unpopular decision the Supreme Court had ever made. Which is shocking given that less than a decade earlier, Justice Black had also authored the Korematsu decision, which is today considered one of the worst SCOTUS decisions ever, as it validated the creation of Japanese concentration camps on U.S. soil. But yeah, definitely not allowing a state-imposed prayer in schools is worse. Sure. One year later, in Abington School District v. Shemp, the Supreme Court ruled that mandatory Bible reading and reciting the Lord's Prayer in schools was unconstitutional, as it violated the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. This, of course, sparked widespread public outrage and intense public scrutiny for one woman at the center of the case, Madeline Murray O'Hare. She was an ardent socialist and founder of American atheists, who had tried to escape to the Soviet Union for fear of facing persecution in the U.S. for her beliefs. When she was denied entry to the Soviet Union, she enrolled her son in public school in Baltimore. She soon realized that after the Pledge of Allegiance, the students all engaged in prayer, and when she tried to have her son removed from the classroom during prayer time, the school refused. So she pulled her son out of school and sued the school district. Despite the court siding with Madeline, the public backlash was swift, with Life magazine referring to her as the most hated woman in America. She was later interviewed for Playboy magazine, in which she identified as a militant feminist and said the iconic line, I'm not saying that all American men are this way, but nine out of 10 are breast fixated, wham bam, thank you ma'am cretins who just don't give a damn about anyone's gratification but their own. Preach, sister. A fully separate video could be made about Madeline, not only for her at times contradictory views and her cultural vilification, but also for her untimely demise. In 1995, her, her son, and her granddaughter were abducted and murdered by a man whom Madeline had written a scathing article about in American Atheist magazine. Their bodies weren't found until 2001. In 1968, the religious right suffered another Supreme Court blow in Epperson v. Arkansas, which ruled that an Arkansas law banning the teaching of evolution was unconstitutional because it was based solely on the beliefs of fundamentalist Christians. Then in 1971, the landmark case Lemon v. Kurtzman came down, ruling unconstitutional laws in Pennsylvania and Rhode Island that gave direct governmental financial assistance to religious schools. The court laid out a three-part test, now known as the Lemon Test, to decide whether a law violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. This is the test you still learn in law school and study for the bar today. The three parts are that the law must have a secular purpose, the law does not have the primary effect of promoting any religious beliefs, and that the law does not excessively entangle religion with government. If it does, then the law is unconstitutional. Then, in 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment passed in Congress and was sent to the states to be ratified, which it never was. And in 1973, Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in America. And at that point, the religious right were like, all right, Hold the fuck up right there. We've had enough. And it was this series of Supreme Court cases strengthening the separation of church and state in combination with the Equal Rights Amendment, which conservative Christians saw as subverting the will of God that women take their God-given roles as wife and mother without question. And then Roe v. Wade gave them the galvanizing final blow they needed to start organizing. And Roe v. Wade became a rallying cry to mobilize social and religious conservatives. The final nail in the coffin came with the D.C. Circuit ruling in Green v. Connolly, which held that segregated in 
institutions can't be considered charitable institutions and therefore can't be tax exempt. The ruling was applied to Bob Jones University, a fundamentalist Christian school that banned interracial dating. And the IRS started investigating the school and whether it should keep its tax exempt status because of this forced segregation of the sexes. At this point, the religious right had started solidifying around the idea that they were the victims of persecution from all sides. First, they can't pray in public schools. Next, they can't ban teaching of evolution. Then they strengthen the separation of church and state and they let women do what they want with their lives and their bodies and now we can't be outwardly racist? Witch hunt! With any strong cultural swing to the left or right, predictably a backlash comes from the other side, creating the increasingly large gap between the right and left that we see in America today. Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself was known to criticize the Roe v. Wade ruling as coming too soon, that abortion should have been decided by the legislature because of the predictable backlash that would happen if the Supreme Court made the decision for us. And she was right. The Roe v. Wade decision, combined with all the other perceived wrongs that the religious right had experienced over the last decade, including the civil rights movement forcing them to come face to face with their own racism, came together to be such a strong galvanizing force for the political awakening and mobilization of the religious right that by 1976, Newsweek proclaimed it the year of the evangelical. In all of this, the leaders of the religious right movement saw a strong rallying cry around the sanctity of the family. Whether we're talking interracial marriage, gay marriage, abortion, prayer, or Christian values, it can be tied back to the sanctity of the family unit and how that godly unit is being threatened at all sides. By 1979, popular fundamentalist preacher Jerry Falwell launched a new advocacy group, the Moral Majority, at the behest of conservative operatives from the Republican Party. The Moral Majority sought to mobilize evangelical voters around moral issues. In a single year, the Moral Majority had mobilized in 47 states, claiming to communicate regularly with 4 million members. It was the first time that Christian voters mobilized on a national national scale and made politics a priority for the church. Through voter mobilization, lobbying, campaign donations, and promoting candidates sympathetic to their cause, the moral majority used a full range of political and social tactics that are still used by the religious right today. And the religious right saw the solution to their problems in presidential candidate Ronald Reagan. They believed he was ready to put their social agenda into action. He supported constitutional amendments to ban abortion and reinstate prayer in public schools. And with the support of this energetic voting bloc behind him, Reagan won the presidency, including two-thirds of the evangelical vote. Unfortunately for the evangelicals, Reagan was too busy fucking up the economy and decimating organized labor to pay attention to their little moral issues. And by the end of his second term, they realized that he had let them down. During the Reagan years, the Supreme Court continued to enforce the separation of church and state, finding in 1984 in Lynch v. Donnelly that any government action that appears to endorse or disapprove of a religion is unconstitutional. In 1985, the court ruled that a moment of prayer violates the Lemon Test and is unconstitutional. By the end of the Reagan administration, the moral majority disbanded. In 1989, the Christian Coalition was founded, picking up the torch of evangelical political action from the moral majority. But this time, instead of focusing on presidential elections, the mission was to organize evangelicals at the grassroots level. At this point, the tide started turning for the religious right. In 1990, a nearly unanimous Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, meant to provide more federal protection for religious exercise. While the act was later found to only apply to federal governmental actions and not to state governments, the act formed the blueprint for 21 individual states to pass their own Religious Freedom Restoration Acts to apply to local government and make it harder for the government to substantially burden a person's exercise of religion, even if the burden results from a rule of general applicability. This means that the government can pass a law not related to religion, but the law will be held unconstitutional if it's found to substantially burden a person's exercise of religion. Then in 2001, George W. Bush took office and the religious right once again saw an opportunity. Bush is an evangelical Methodist. He spoke freely of his faith and made promises to enact policies advocated for by evangelicals. And this time, he actually followed through. He signed bills forbidding late-term abortions and restricting embryonic stem cell research. He also established the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives within the first few weeks of his presidency. However, then 9-11 happened, and Bush became bogged down in national security concerns and two wars with Iraq and Afghanistan, and he failed to push through the biggest parts of the evangelical agenda, constitutional amendments, banning abortion, and gay marriage. So the religious right gets disillusioned with national politics once more, right around the time that Democrat John Kerry loses the election to Bush, and Democrats then become mobilized to change what they saw as a never-ending war and soon economic collapse in the 2008 financial crisis. Enter Obama, the evangelical death wish. He is the first president to acknowledge non-believers in his inaugural address, saying, we are a nation of Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus, and non-believers. And then of course, backlash, because 
That's what happens every time in this country. With the election of Obama came things like Obamacare, new Supreme Court appointments, the legalization of gay marriage at a national level, an influx of immigrants and programs like DACA, our first non-white president, and the perceived further erosion of Christian family values. The religious right was once again feeling persecuted, like they did in the 60s and 70s during the civil rights movement and Supreme Court cases, further establishing a separation between church and state. They were victims of the woke left. Their country was out to get them. And you know what a person persecuted group of people needs? A savior. And they found that savior in Donald Trump. A man with no religion other than capitalism, but who was willing to sing and dance in whatever way would win him the presidency. In him, they saw someone who was willing to say the off-color things they feel they're not allowed to say because, you know, being a bigot and a predator is slightly more frowned upon now than it was in the made-up version of the 1950s that the religious right wishes to return to. But not for Trump. He says what he wants. He's a fighter. He won't be intimidated. And he spoke their language, i.e. never in full sentences. He didn't use the fancy elitist language of the Democrats or even other Republicans. He was, somehow, despite being the most conspicuous millionaire of the last few decades, a man of the people to them. And despite being a many times divorced adulterer, he was going to bring forth the Christian family values that had so long been under attack. He was their man. And because of the strength of that grassroots voting bloc, a bloc that had been formed and perfected in the 70s and 80s, Trump became their president. And when he wasn't their president anymore after the 2020 election, the religious right, and specifically the burgeoning group of white Christian nationalists, denied reality to the point of causing a literal insurrection. And that group of white Christian nationalists is so active because their central beliefs are once again being threatened. Christian nationalists can be identified by three key beliefs. One, that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation with the aim of erasing the line separating church and state, believing that God chose the U.S. for a special role in history. According to a recent survey by the Barna Group, an increasing number of American Christians believe strongly that the U.S. is a Christian nation, has not oppressed minorities, and has been chosen by God to lead the world. This despite the fact that the framers of the Constitution were a collection of atheists, Unitarians, Deists, and liberal Protestants, among other denominations, and that the 1797 Treaty of Tripoli, a treaty ratified unanimously by the Senate, which was half filled at the time with signers of the Constitution, declared the government of the United United States of America is not, in any sense, founded on Christian religion. And Thomas Jefferson was a strong proponent of the clear wall separating church and state. But it can be easier to conveniently ignore these truths than to contend with a version of America where the country isn't infallible, where no god played a role, and where white people got ahead on the backs of black and native people, especially when this group of white Christian nationalists are being fear-mongered into believing that immigrants are dangerous and flooding in to take our jobs, and black people are dangerous and rioting in the streets. It's the same logic that Puritans used to justify stealing land from natives, the same logic that slaveholders used to justify enslaving people, the same fear that existed during the civil rights movement, made all the more powerful by the community building force of the internet. Second key belief that identifies Christian nationalists today is a belief in a version of Christ as a warrior, as depicted in the book of Revelation, not the one depicted in the Gospels. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is said to be a warrior with eyes like flames of fire and a robe dipped in blood, who led the armies of heaven on white horses in a final battle against the forces of the Antichrist. In the eyes of white Christian nationalists, especially those who participated in or supported the January 6th insurrection, they're following in the righteous footsteps of Christ and believe themselves themselves to be Christ-like in both their perceived persecutions and their fight against those that would persecute them. According to CNN, a survey last year by the Public Religion Research Institute revealed that of all respondents, white evangelicals were the religious group most likely to agree with the statement, true American patriots might have to resort to violence in order to save the country. To them, the ends of protecting what they believe to be a righteously Christian nation ordained by God justify the means of using force to protect that fantasy version of America. It's also a militant exhibition of masculinity that appeals to white Christian nationalists. Samuel Perry, co-author of the book Taking America Back for God, wrote recently that the more you line up with Christian nationalism, the less likely you are to support gun control. Guns are practically an element of worship in the church of white Christian nationalism. This adds further depth and color to my video about why Americans are so obsessed with guns, which you should go check out after this. It is, in part, because of this convolution of guns with Christian nationalism that has a strangle 
hold on the religious right that's only growing. And the final belief that typifies today's white Christian nationalists is the belief that there's such a person as a real American. This idea was born in part from Sarah Palin, who frequently referred to the real America and the pro-America areas of this great nation. This idea took hold and now white Christian nationalists have adopted the worldview that America is divided between the real Americans and the other citizens who don't deserve the same rights. Studies have found a correlation between white Christian nationalism and support for gerrymandering and the electoral college, two ideas that put more power into the hands of white and rural voters. They also tend to believe that it doesn't matter what the voting machines say, because we all know that real Americans voted for Donald Trump. Philip Gorski, historian and author of the book The Flag and the Cross, sums it up well writing, the United States cannot be both a truly multiracial democracy, a people of people and a nation of nations, and a white Christian nation at the same time. This is why white Christian nationalism has become a serious threat to American democracy, perhaps the most serious threat it now faces. This is in part due to the fact that white evangelicals are more politically active than the average population. More evangelicals are registered to vote on average and more of those registered actually show up and vote than the average US voter. This means that even though there are relatively small percentage of voters, their numbers matter and their leaders are involved in politics in such a profound way that any Republican presidential hopeful has to get in bed with the religious right. Because as much as people who subscribe to the ideals of the religious right, especially the burgeoning white Christian nationalism movement, love to differentiate themselves from democratic sheep who don't think for themselves, the foot soldiers of the religious right movement may show up to marches, vote, and donate, but it's the movement's leaders, often moving in elite circles, that consciously reframe culture war issues in order to capture and control the votes of a large subsection of the American public. Because they understand that if you can get people to show up and vote based on just one or two issues, then you can control their vote. So they use these wedge issues to maintain political power for themselves and their allies, increase their funding, and enact economic policies that benefit the billionaires who fund them, tying conservative economic policies to religion. The Bible and God oppose progressive income taxes. Regulation of business and public funding of the social safety net are against the biblical model. And a free market system was God's plan for America. And in turn, these practices then preserve the fortunes of powerful families. Which is why religious nationalism often goes hand in hand with authoritarianism, which frequently exploits religious nationalism to suppress dissent and keep disempowered members of society not only in a subordinate position, but actually brainwashed to continue supporting the initiatives that are actively leading to their own oppression. There's so much more to say on this issue and so many overlapping things that have led to the growth of the religious right and the burgeoning group of white Christian nationalists we see today. To add more context to the role of the religious right in America today, I suggest checking out some of my past videos, including why conservatives are so obsessed with trans kids and why America is so obsessed with communism. The Flag and the Cross by Yale historian Philip Gorski is a really important deep dive into the growth and danger of white Christian nationalism. And it goes so much deeper than I can cover in a YouTube video. So to say thank you for 200,000 subscribers and to help spread the knowledge a little more, I'm giving away two copies of The Flag and the Cross over on my Instagram, linked in the description below. If you like this video, you might also like my video on why Americans are so obsessed with guns. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patron, Brett Piantek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.